Okay, I think we can get started. Um, hello everyone, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar. YAML is optional, exploring an app developer's Kubernetes options. I'm Karen Chu, Community Program Manager at Microsoft and Cloud Native Ambassador, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenter today, Paul Burt, Technical Product Marketing Engineer at NetApp. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not gonna be able to talk as an attendee, so if you do have something to ask, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions there and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be, a, be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. And with that, I'll hand it over to Paul to kick off today's presentation. Great, uh, thanks Karen. Uh, so yeah, as Karen noted, we're gonna dive into an app developer's perspective uh, working with uh, Kubernetes. So uh, this is a brief outline of what we're gonna cover today. We're gonna look at uh, some level setting with why containers, why did we get into this whole mess to begin with? Uh, we're gonna look at why YAML is seen as somewhat of a tragic uh, tool that we're forced to use in this space. Um, and then we're gonna uh, return to the dev perspective and kind of highlight uh, some of the things that they lost when they made the transition over to container technologies. Uh, after that, uh, as the big chunk of this presentation, we're gonna explore some of the, uh, uh, I guess a smattering, a, a tasting plate of some of the developer oriented options. And then um, we'll end with a summary uh, at the, the and naturally, I suppose. <laughs> so, uh, you know, before containers, we all lived in a world similar to this. We uh, may have deployed a Node.js application, um, and in order to simplify things, our, our production or operations engineers may have told us to pin to a specific version of Node. Um, this complicated things in that uh, the libraries or the modules that we depended on uh, sometimes didn't support those versions. Uh, sometimes those versions were tough to uh, upgrade from uh, once we had so many developers uh, depending on them. Uh, this was a relatively messy world. Uh, and this is a phrase that anyone who's from that world is probably used to uh, uttering quite frequently. So um, I think of the benefit of containers as taking this phrase, hell is other people, hell is other people's development environment. Um, so for me, one of the big things that containers solved is this conflict that we have of uh, things working locally, but not working in production. Um, you know, it doesn't solve everything under the sun there, but uh, it, it's one of the biggest features of, of a container uh, based workflow where things are isolated uh, neatly and uh, packaged up very nicely so we can convey them over to folks on the other side of the uh, team that are uh, helping us run our systems. Uh, the advent of containers happened to coincide with a couple other things that popped in. So, uh, you know, some of the difficulties that we experience uh, are certainly not only due to containers, some of it's due to the advent of cloud computing. Uh, you know, microservices are another thing that uh, that containers tend to be aligned with. So uh, transitioning to those uh, philosophies in addition to the transition to containers and Kubernetes uh, can be part of uh, the complexity that gets added in when uh, we look at what's required to move to this container native or cloud native mindset. So uh, one thing that developers lose is things like hot reloading. So if you're a Node.js developer, uh, as in our example, um, Nodemon is a very popular application for hot reloading uh, your application once you save your file. Uh, it'll automatically refresh uh, the new version in your web browser. Um, once you introduce having to compile a container and build that way, uh, you lose some of that uh, quick feedback loop. Uh, so that's unfortunate. Um, container developers also have to, or sorry, the new developers working in this container paradigm also have to learn Docker files, which uh, you know you might say is not that much, but uh, it is just another little nudge in the direction of complexity and difficulty compared to not having to think about all this stuff. Uh, and then, uh, you know, otherwise it, it's just 
a lot of tools had to be replaced to work with containers in this new mindset. So, uh, you know, Kubernetes has been called the Linux of the cloud, and that's just because back in the day, we might have talked about the LAMP stack, which was Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Um, Linux was part of the base layer that we targeted. Kubernetes is sort of becoming that new base layer that we target. And with that means uh, having to learn everything that uh, Kubernetes brings along with it. So uh, that can complicate things a little bit if we're a developer just trying to get our app running, um, not hoping to uh, you know, delay things too much. Mo most of what developers tend to be uh, interested in is velocity. Uh, when it comes to speed and uh, your ability to innovate. So uh, you can see how containers maybe slow some of that down. Uh, learning curve of all these things we have to relearn and retool in order to work in this new context and environment. So, you know, monitoring has changed with Prometheus uh, kind of bursting onto the scene and um, a lot of the other tooling around security and uh, RBAC and all those other things, uh, storage, connecting storage to your application, that, that all requires new sorts of thought process for uh, how you're going to deploy your app and get it working. Uh, and our language for interfacing with all of these new resources that Kubernetes is bringing to us is YAML. Um, now, I like YAML generally, but uh, when you work with it day in and day out, uh, some of the warts sort of become very apparent to you. Uh, so the spacing can be an issue. Um, I'm not going to try and convince you of all of the things that are a struggle with YAML. Instead, I'm going to rely on uh, more prominent voices than myself to uh, make that plea. I, I like particularly Joe Bita here, um, one of the creators of Kubernetes, saying that it's tragic that YAML is sort of the thing that we all work with. I also like uh, Brian Lyles and Kelsey Hightower's take here, uh, in particularly calling YAML uh, Kubernetes assembly code in that uh, it's an intermediate uh, sort of value between what humans can understand well and what machines can understand well, but that compromise ultimately means no one is fully happy with how YAML is working. So um, I think Brian is totally right here in that YAML uh, asks for a higher level construct to help you sort of manage it. <clears throat> a particularly good example of some of the challenges of YAML, you'll, you'll note that this is just a couple weeks back, October 9th, 9th 2019. Um, there was a, a recent CVE that was discovered. So uh, this comes from a chain of attacks that uh, I think have been known in the XML world. Uh, basically, when you have a, a markup language that uh, allows you to use anchors or things that reference other things. Um, you can wind up with a recursive set of references as pictured here that uh, when a, a uh, server tries to process can quickly sort of spike the CPU to 100%. Um, and that's exactly what was happening. There was a, uh, a part of the API server that was uh, going to process and look at the YAML file before actually validating that um, someone should have access. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it caused a big issue in the community. So you likely updated your Kubernetes cluster uh, recently as a result of this attack um, being announced. Um, I particularly, again, enjoy <laughs> Joe Bita's uh, take on this. Um, you know, I, I think he's thinking in the open here, uh, asking other people to help him brainstorm more than, um, you know, punching down at YAML. Uh, but uh, he's asking the question to uh, really explore the space. Is there a way we can eliminate YAML as, as a problem here? Um, these extra features, these higher level features that YAML has uh, baked in um, complicate uh, things as demonstrated with, with the recursiveness there. And um, I, I liken this to Joe essentially suggesting that uh, we nuke everything and um, start over. It's, it's obviously not plausible, uh, but it is an interesting uh, sort of experiment to think about um, what could we do if we didn't have to interface with YAML. And that's sort of uh, where we're gonna go um, as we look through uh, the rest of the stuff in this space. Uh, so I think Really summarizing that, Kubernetes is fantastic. We all love it because it solves an inherently complex problem for us. Distributed systems are hard. Um, some of that complexity Kubernetes uh, resolves. Some of it uh, is, you know, uh, it's, it's what Fred Brooks would call essential complexity. Uh, it's, it's, 
it's inherent to the problem space and very difficult to remove uh, without sort of a, a leaky abstraction. Um, and, you know, just looking at the amount of resources that an average user of Kubernetes has to get familiar with and um, think about when they're deploying something to a Kubernetes cluster, uh, it's, it's very clear to see uh, how overwhelming and demanding this is. So uh, it's understandable when people complain on Twitter and in Slack and um, over coffee about how, uh, how much of a pain Kubernetes is. Why do people do this to themselves? Uh, well, uh, they, they may not have experienced the challenge of running distributed systems without Kubernetes, but uh, you know, it's still a fair criticism that uh, the introduction of Kubernetes and asking them to get on board with containers and Kubernetes uh, is, is part of uh, what uh, is challenging for them. So I, I call this space shuttle design. Um, you know, Kubernetes is designed to a very fine precision um, and it protects you from the hostile environment of uh, the distributed system space. Uh, distributed systems are very difficult to do correctly. Um, if you've studied Paxos um, or looked at Raft, sort of the history that brought those algorithms uh, into our, uh, our domain of knowledge, uh, it, it's been pretty burdensome to work with those. Raft is actually a way to simplify um, and um, make Paxos approachable for us mere mortals working in distributed systems. Um, so uh, Kubernetes is our space shuttle. It is our, our vehicle that is taking us to a hostile land and keeping us alive there and allowing us to flourish. But um, space shuttles are complex. Space shuttles are not like our remotes for our TVs. Um, the modern remotes that we work with rather. Uh, the old school remotes uh, are something else, but uh, as a developer or just a human being, um, we tend to prefer designs like this that uh, we think are elegant and sleek. And um, there's not a lot of learning curve. We, we can infer from context uh, what's expected on every screen uh, and that can guide us through the process. Um, looking at the list of Kubernetes objects, uh, that is obviously, <laughs> uh, relatively difficult to infer from just context. You have to do a bit of studying. So um, in order to solve those problems, um, most applications these days are targeting YAML. Some are targeting the CI CD workflow so that uh, Git can be your, your source of truth. Um, and often a lot of these solutions span sort of multiple problem domains and what they're trying to address. Uh, but yeah, at, at the end of the day, it, it's really, uh, we have to figure out all of these things for developers coming on board to Kubernetes. Uh, and I think for the most part, none of these uh, issues are really solved out of the box for them. Um, to some of them, it may be more appealing to go back to this pinned version of a, a VM or a pinned version of, of software that you deploy to production to keep things uh, working nicely with each other. So um, most of these solutions uh, kind of run on a spectrum, uh, I like to think. Um, some make YAML suck less by uh, filling in default values or uh, uh, minimizing the amount of fields you have to enter in uh, manually. They, they give you tools or DSLs or command line uh, options to uh, automatically sort of parse data and uh, make things magically work. Um, and others are uh, tools that are a little bit more opinionated. They uh, obviate some uh, of the more complex things that limits your freedom of action at the end of the day as a developer, but it also means you can get more uh, close to that push button workflow. And what works best for your organization and your developers uh, is wholly up to um, you, but I, I think in general, the Kubernetes distributions that we've been uh, consuming and downloading um, haven't been getting very opinionated uh, in this way. So um, it's it's a little tragic that uh, developers are are left to the the whim of their operators or their organization, giving them the time to customize their Kubernetes in such a way that uh, it can really serve them uh, under this form. So. Uh, Let's look at some of the tools that uh, are available to us to simplify this, this YAML conundrum. Uh, 
So the first is one that I know the CNCF has done a webinar on recently. Uh, I think it's also been donated to the CNCF Sandbox. It's Brigade. Um, it's from the folks who started uh, Deus uh, and eventually moved into Microsoft. Um, and like shout out to them for being some of the first people to really think about uh, developer workflows in the Kubernetes space. Uh, I like this, uh, the Brigade homepage, just because they are literally advertising, leave your YAML at home. Um, one thing to note here is what they've done is they've introduced a JavaScript based DSL. So um, this domain specific language, uh, you know, you, you could argue that maybe it's not as declarative as you would like it to be. Um, I'm going to argue that it is okay and actually totally natural to mix procedural or some imperative tools um, with declarative software. And I'll give you the example of, uh, you know, every developer out there who uh, runs a query on SQL and then downloads the results of that query into Python and continues to uh, shape, uh, you know, the results in Python. Um, I think that is a accepted and um, fruitful way to work with things. And uh, what a lot of these tools are doing is trying to figure out where the right boundaries are for um, the declarative piece and the imperative or procedural piece. Um, so this is cool. The, the idea behind using JavaScript as your DSL is that uh, JavaScript is one of the most popular languages on GitHub. Um, if you look at the statistics for all the repositories that are up there. So it's a language that's widely understood. Um, and what Brigade does as a tool is it solves the CI integration with Kubernetes. So um, as a developer, uh, you don't want to use a tool like kubectl generally. Um, you sort of want git to be your source of truth. Uh, so this enables a git push type workflow um, where git is your source of truth. And you, know, you can check dashboards and make sure things are working the way they're supposed to. Um, but Brigade gives you the tools to uh, create specialized workflows, pipelines, um, get your code running on your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, another early entrant into this space is MetaParticle. Um, it's gone a little stale uh, over time, which we'll uh, look at in a little bit, but uh, this takes the declarative piece. Um, and rather than give you a DSL in contrast to Brigade, uh, what this is giving you is an SDK. So whatever your language is that you're working in, um, you know, in part, it'll give you a query that you can import in your code or your Kubernetes resource uh, as a separate uh, file that you, you have somewhere in your repo. Uh, you're defining it directly in line with your code. So the hope is that uh, this makes it easier to see exactly how this uh, this application is supposed to be deployed. Um, and then the MetaParticle system uh, reads this uh, once you pass all your tests and everything and uh, can help push it out to uh, your Kubernetes cluster. So uh, that's the idea behind MetaParticle. Uh, as noted, uh, it is a little stale. Uh, there's, you know, when I checked the issues, there was a comment from August 26 that was uh, not responded to, uh, basically asking uh, what's happening uh, with MetaParticle. So uh, I think we can, we can safely note that uh, the focus is elsewhere at the moment for uh, Brennan Burns and uh, the team that sort of uh, brought this out, but uh, it is open source. So if you think this is a great idea, you like the philosophy of an SDK, um, I'm sure they would be happy to have folks get involved and um, continue building on this. So uh, what MetaParticle does is it, it lowers the burden uh, necessary to learn a Docker file or um, Kate's YAML formats. Um, it lets you work with the language and the tooling that you're already accustomed to. Um, so it lowers the sort of learning curve required to um, get your resource up and running in Kubernetes. Um, Isopod is sort of something that's a little more recently come onto the frontier. Uh, it, uh, it's an interesting approach. It also uh, takes a DSL approach. Uh, this is an example of what IcePod might look like taken from some of their docs. Uh, and you know, you, you can see some distinct things here. Uh, number one, it looks uh, vaguely Python-like. That's because it's based on a language called Starlark. Um, that's the same language that Bazel and Buck, uh, the build systems use. Um, Tilt, another program we'll look at in a little bit, also uses Starlark, um, I believe. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, the, the thing that uh, they're trying to address here uh, is that your testing um, needs to happen uh, along with your config changes. And um, being able to do that in a procedural or an imperative way where you're using control structures like if, if else or um, 
all, all that stuff uh, is is pretty conducive to, to getting things up and running. So um, this is sort of, I think, the base file of what uh, your your isopod format would look like. Um, and I, I'd like to think of isopod as solving um, the need for testing your configuration changes before you push them to production. So uh, I think there was a bug on uh, BigQuery that came out a year ago due to config changes. Um, that's not to say that BigQuery dropped the ball or anything. It's just to say that uh, this stuff is really, really hard and the best of us, uh, you know, uh, are, can't be perfect when we uh, manage these things. So testing is very important and I think the push towards um, having your tests sort of uh, live with your config changes um, is relatively important. CNAB is another, uh, I think, modern technology that a lot of folks might not be familiar with. Um, if you check their website, uh, it's Container Native Application Bundle. Um, so it, they, they say CNAB facilitates the bundling and installing and managing of container native apps uh, and the services that go along with them. This is just the idea that uh, an application in Kubernetes is often not just a single container, um, even if it is a single container and there's no sidecars or anything, uh, there are usually a lot of supporting services that go along with that. And uh, I like to think of this, uh, if I'm elevator pitching this to people, as it's just Docker Compose, but it's more neutral. So Docker Compose is obviously tightly coupled to uh, Docker Swarm and um, Docker's way of doing things. Uh, the container ecosystem uh, with OCI and Run C have since uh, sort of become a little more agnostic. And uh, CNAB is, is an agnostic or a more neutral version of Docker Compose, where you can collect and group your application together, but uh, and you know push it to different locations, uh, and it's it's not specific to any one thing. So you know if something else comes out beyond Kubernetes, where uh, you want to run your application, CNAB uh, hypothetically should work in that context, uh, which is pretty cool. It's sort of uh, you get the immediate advantage of uh, having a neutral way to define your app. Uh, and then the long-term potential advantage of it sort of uh, being a technology that, that lives uh, on beyond just the, the life cycle of a single product. Um, yeah, the, the world is bigger than Kubernetes. Um, if you happen to use Helm, um, I believe the folks that are behind Helm have even said that, you know, CNAB potentially can be something that is backing Helm, um, which is cool as well. Uh, one thing to note is that CNAB uh, has you know, come into the news in recent weeks. This is a post by Jimmy Zielinski, uh, PM and uh, I think engineer from CoreOS and Red Hat, uh, talking about OCR artifacts and some of the early work that they did uh, 2016, 2017, um, thinking about how to store uh, Helm or um, more complete applications in a container registry. Uh, the problem is that a container registry is designed just for a container. It's not designed for all of the things around the container, like the services and everything. Um, and CNAB uh, is sort of becoming this thing that uh, is being explored as, uh, should we store a CNAB object in uh, our, our registry as well. Uh, this is uh, something they're actively designing at the moment. Uh, and as Jimmy points out in this Medium post, you should absolutely reach out to the folks at Red Hat or Microsoft or any of the other companies that are um, contributing to this and doing the early work on it because uh, they, they can't read your mind. So uh, if there's an essential feature that you think needs to be uh, added to that spec for uh, CNAB to work for you uh, as a, a build artifact that you can store in your container registry, uh, definitely get in touch. Um, you, you will be helping them out. Um, I'm sure they will be very grateful for uh, your feedback from a person on the front lines kind of doing this stuff. So uh, CNAB solves the problem of portability beyond just Kubernetes. Uh, it also solves solves the problem somewhat of uh, organizing the, the disparate resources that are associated with a service running in Kubernetes um, and good organization, as we'll see in some of the other tools we look at, uh, does also help reduce some of the complexity of uh, managing your workflow as a developer. Um, something that has come out a little more recently from uh, the same team behind CNAB uh, at Microsoft uh, is OAM. Uh, I think it's the open application model, if I remember correctly. And for Kubernetes, this is uh, implemented as a reference as Rudder. So um, 
I saw this happen on Twitter as I was creating the slide deck recently, so I figured I'd cut and paste it in here. Um, and uh, the idea, uh, as Harry puts it here, is developers don't have to consume system calls directly to write a program on Linux. Um, you know, if Kubernetes is the assembly of, uh, or sorry, if YAML is the assembly of Kubernetes, then uh, they're doing something very similar in, in Kubernetes space currently when uh, our developers are writing applications uh, for Kubernetes. So um, how can we simplify that? What layer can we introduce to create sort of a user space? Um, and the response that OEM is giving uh, is that, uh, you know, maybe you can organize your YAML files in such a way that uh, some of the YAML is ideally suited for an application operator to fill in. So the person running the infrastructure will fill in those fields um, and then uh, other parts of the YAML file are things that a developer will fill in because they know more about how the application runs um, on that level. If you can uh, give each of these roles, uh, you, you know, an idealized file, a more organized file that um, they can easily pencil in values for, um, it can reduce some of the confusion and sort of uh, ease the burden of uh, bridging the dev to ops um, transition when you're you're pushing code to production. So. Um, I think that's a really cool idea, and I think that's something that a lot of folks miss um, when they're initially uh, just kind of looking at things. Um, this is what a, a YAML file for uh, OAM Rudder looks like. Um, it looks very similar to uh, some of the YAML we're already defining. A lot of the same values are there. We're still defining um, the port and um, you know, some additional uh, characteristics like the image, uh, any, any other uh, config values that are important, uh, and the system then uh, digests that and produces the resulting uh, necessary Kubernetes resource uh, at the end of the day. So uh, the idea is that even though it's still YAML, it's more organized and it becomes your new sort of interface for uh, looking at all of these things. You, you are looking at less at the end of the day because dev and ops are collaborating better. Um, so in a way, it's exploiting Conway's law. The idea that the communication structure your organization um, affects how your programs are built and deployed. Um, you know, you're exploiting the fact that there tends to be uh, different concerns between developers and operations folks, uh, as much as DevOps wants to make things everyone's concern. Um, you know, you, you'll, I don't know that anyone ever fully gets to that ideal. Uh, we always pursue the ideal because it's a good thing, but uh, at the end of the day, we, we are beholden to um, separate concerns. So uh, the idea here is that things can be simplified by uh, looking at things through the lens of uh, what your role is, which is pretty cool. Um, build packs are an old technology. If you're used to Heroku uh, or Cloud Foundry, um, this is the tech that they really invested in. And uh, these are just like really simple. Like you can see the, the only real uh, important bit here in this app. Dot, I think it's app.js or app.json um, is the image that we're specifying, which is the build pack that we want uh, to be used for this uh, actual uh, piece of code to get built. Uh, usually there's something called a proc file, which is just you're specifying the command that's required to start your uh, web application. Um, and um, basically you're, you're off to the races. Uh, a lot of things are sort of figured out for you. The container gets created automatically because that's what that build pack is. Um, it's, it's a process for uh, bundling and uh, building a container. Um, and uh, it will then deploy to Kubernetes if you have other tooling hooked in. Um, to make get your source of truth. So if you were to combine build packs with something like Brigade that uh, kind of bridges the gap, um, you, you can have a really neat system uh, in, in place. Uh, but uh, one thing to note here is that build packs, they, they are one of those solutions that is abstracting some things away. Um, you're losing some freedom of control, uh, obviously, by not being able to specify a lot of the details in your normal Docker file. Um, you're, you're dealing a lot more with idioms or expected values, intelligent defaults, uh, and you can customize those to your organization by creating your own build packs, but uh, that is a burden uh, on the system still. So it's, it's a trade-off rather than a pure solution. Um, Tilt is a really cool tool. It solves uh, the Nodemon uh, problem. 
um, that we looked at earlier. So uh, this is an example tilt file from one of their tutorial uh, areas. And you can see uh, the important part here is, uh, you know, it's, it's written in Starlark, that same Pythonic uh, kind of language, but uh, they're talking about how live updates are going to work and how things are going to be synchronized. So uh, what Tilt is doing is doing hot reloading. It's, it's uh, replacing the code that's inside of the container with the most up-to-date code that you just saved in your editor, and you're spared the uh, burden of having to recompile your container image uh, by hand or uh, through a script you wrote every single time. Um, they've kind of figured out a lot of the edge cases and complexities around that and given you this nice tool uh, that not only speeds up your iterative development, but uh, it also makes debugging a lot easier when you're, um, you, you want to see it, you want to make a change, see if it fixed something for the bug that you're looking at. Um, that's also part of this, this process. So um, Tilt is uh, reduce, bringing back that, uh, I would say, quick feedback loop to you uh, as a developer that you, you usually lose when you move to container technologies. Cool. Uh, this one actually isn't an external project. Uh, admission controllers, uh, those of you who are familiar with Kubernetes uh, may know that this is sort of bundled in and how uh, a lot of authorization and stuff happens when things first enter the cluster. Um, there are uh, mutating admission controllers that can actually make changes to files. So uh, I like to think of the, the base uh, admission controller limit ranger uh, as one of those things that can um, make changes and make life easier. So uh, if someone doesn't specify a resource limit for uh, the application that they're deploying to your Kubernetes cluster, um, limit ranger looks at it and actually enters a default value for you. And this is one of those things that uh, can reduce the burden. Uh, it's one less field that a developer has to enter into their YAML and think about. Um, and uh, this is specified at the cluster level. So um, depending on your environment, you can have different values for your limit ranger um, that, uh, you know, work, work for the context that that app, app is running in. Uh, I like this a lot, uh, but I, I think one downside to this potentially can be uh, that it's a little bit opaque. You may deploy your application to production, um, forget that a lot of these values are getting mutated or tweaked as things are getting pulled into the cluster through the API server, um, and it can seem sort of magical. So um, you definitely want to think about how you're communicating how your admission controllers work. Um, if you want to enable or disable admission controllers, I believe they're flags on the uh, API server. So um, you know, talk to your cluster admin about doing that. Uh, Helm is sort of the, the standard that I hope all of us are familiar with. Uh, and a Helm chart is something uh, that uh, looks very similar to a normal Kubernetes object. Uh, it's even got the name of a replication controller up top here in this example. Um, one thing to know is that, you know, near the bottom of this page, there's some curly braces. And what they're doing there is uh, templating. These are Go templates. Um, Go templates look very similar to uh, mustache templates or Jinja templates. Um, there are some uh, commands or procedures you can sort of feed in in addition to just a list of values as seen pictured here. Uh, I think uh, you know, th there is some uh, bit of this that's unfortunate and that people do have to be familiar with Go templates, uh, specific sort of uh, flavor of templating to uh, really uh, dig into this stuff. But uh, I do think that learning curve is relatively minor. Um, a lot of the tools that uh, we're going to look at uh, in the next couple pages, and one of them that we already looked at previously, Isopod, uh, are going to be critical of this. And uh, I don't think it's a big knock on uh, Helm in general. Um, it's more just to say, uh, it's sort of like, there's a famous Bjorn Strostrup uh, quote about C++, like the only reason people are complaining is because they use it. Um, so uh, the people who are passionate about this stuff uh, are passionate because they're using Helm day to day um, and it's worked for them and it's, it's figured out a, a solution to a problem um, well enough that it's become very popular and well loved by a lot of folks. Um, now what a lot of these tools are looking to do is kind of do the whole, uh, I'm gonna stand on the, the shoulders of giants that came before me um, and see if I can improve this a little bit. So um, we look at case on it and customize. Um, the context for those tools is really gonna be about uh, seeing if we can do something that's even better than templating. Templating works well enough for some cases, but uh, when you get to complex multi-cluster, multi-environment scenarios, uh, there can be some challenges. 
Uh, so uh, what Helm does really nicely is uh, it's part of what CNAB did. It bundles your applications together. Um, it does something that nothing else does, which is it gives your developers a menu of options that you can really choose from. Um, and it also helps manage sort of the basic life cycle of your application if your, your charts are defined well. So um, Helm is a great basis to start with if you have absolutely no developer friendly tooling. Um, and I believe Helm version three, uh, which is the version that has uh, uh, tillerless deployment, um, uses CRDs and uh, other fancy controller stuff instead on Kubernetes. Uh, that is in a release candidate phase right now. So uh, now is a great time to uh, download that, test it out, give your feedback to the Helm team. Cool. Uh, KSonnet is a tool that is based on something called JSonnet. Um, and the idea is that uh, if you give people a basic uh, command line tool and some uh, primitive objects or prototypes or uh, components as they call them sometimes, um, you can use those prototypes uh, and primitive objects to combine things together on the command line uh, and generate very quickly uh, the type of resource that you want to deploy. Um, I think the obvious criticism of this is just that there's a lot of complexity here. You're, you're learning not only this new CLI tool, but uh, there's a whole language that comes along with it. This is uh, the example of JSONnet that uh, KSonnet is based on. Uh, the idea is that uh, instead of using YAML, uh, where you have to deal with some of the funkiness of those uh, anchors that uh, caused the CB we looked at earlier, the billion laps attack, um, we're using a simple JSON format, which is a subset. Um, and in that JSON format, we can define functions and uh, some other fancy things that uh, can really help with the management of uh, any of these resources that we're dealing with. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's worth noting that when Heptio was acquired and they sort of took inventory of uh, what was happening, uh, you know, how much excitement or uh, community uh, interest there was, they, they found that a lot of folks found Case on it uh, pretty challenging. So um, they started to scale down their investment in the project. Um, it's still, again, open source, similar to MetaParticle. Uh, and uh, it's, I, I think there are a lot of interesting and good lessons to take away from uh, what KSonnet did. Uh, in particular, Brian Miles gave a great talk at KubeCon um, recently, and um, I think this design criteria, I want the easy things to be easy and the hard things to be possible. Um, I hope that's something that everyone who's working on these developer-focused tools uh, is keeping in mind. Um, you know, the, the hard things to be possible is probably speaking more to you don't want to limit uh, the action that people can take. So build packs are sort of maybe uh, discarding that uh, a little early. Um, but uh, this idea that uh, keeping things simple and the goal is uh, to make things accessible and approachable um, is a great North Star for uh, anyone looking to improve the developer experience. So uh, case on it uh, really, uh, I would say in contrast to Helm, um, addresses a lot of the problems that people have with multi-cluster, multi-environment, multiplicatively complex configuration scenarios. Um, it really goes to great lengths to keep your code dry and composable uh, so uh, you can kind of assemble what you need uh, together on the fly. That comes with some learning, but hey. Uh, so whereas case on it, uh, you know, eschews uh, YAML in, in favor of JSON and um, uses an entirely different format, um, customize <laughs> uh, goes the other direction. Customize says, you know what, like, YAML is a disease. What if we gave you another disease, which is more YAML, and those two diseases fight each other out? Um, I think that was a, a cure way back in the day, one of the primitive cures uh, for malaria, as they would inject you with something that would give you a fever, um, and the fever would kill the malaria, and bing, bang, boom, your body gets over the fever, uh, you're good to go. Um, it's, it, it sounds primitive when you first hear about solving YAML with more YAML, but um, once you dive into it, uh, it's actually really cool. So uh, there's a great talk on this, uh, uh, the detail of which I don't have time to emulate fully, uh, given the, the time limits of, of this presentation, but uh, customize, deploy your app with a YAML free template, Ryan Cox. It's another great KubeCon talk, kind of diving into how this works. Um, it works by uh, you defining a basis that, uh, or using a generator to generate a basis um, for you to then overlay or patch 
um, your values on top of. So this looks familiar to anyone who's worked with Kubernetes YAML, uh, hopefully. Um, this is an example of them generating a basis that we might want to use as an overlay. Um, and then if we are doing an overlay, say for different environments, um, we, uh, in this case, we're, we're renaming the prefix of name to dev or prod um, based on uh, which of these environments we want to deploy to. So if we go back one step, um, you know, what, what is the metadata name my nginx? Um, that would be dev my nginx in the dev context and prod my nginx in the prod context. So um, customize ends up uh, being a lot simpler. There's maybe you know, a handful of um, different overlay commands that uh, give you access to a whole lot of options for um, customizing your templates and you can uh, overlay multiple times on a single base. Uh, you can use a base uh, in many different uh, projects, and in this case, like as for dev or as for production. Um, and Customize has actually been bundled in with uh, KubeCuddle as of 1.14. So um, this is a tool that is actually potentially available to you today. Uh, it, you may not have even realized it's installed on your system um, and could make life a lot easier for uh, managing and uh, creating Kubernetes objects. So. Uh, this, this tool manages to stay both uh, declarative, we're not using control structures or uh, DSL that uh, is putting us through like for loops or if then statements. Um, and uh, it, it, it applies very cleanly on top of the, the format that we're already familiar with. Um, if you're like me and you were a little scared by solving YAML with more YAML and that being a little confusing, um, I uh, definitely want to point you to the SHIP project, um, which is another open source project that uh, kind of uh, assists with customize uh, and it can show you sort of the, the desired target of uh, you know, uh, these, these different base files getting patched, how, how these values are gonna change at the end of the day. Um, when multiple overlays sort of enter the picture, um, it's very easy to lose track of what is changing what and what order things are happening in. Um, a tool like SHIP can really help simplify that. Um, so I think with SHIP, uh, a tool similar to this, uh, you, you get a very fluid and nice experience with Customize uh, that ends up being really cool and um, it's it's a lot more than the sum of its parts. Uh, the 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 YAMLness being YAML native, YAML centric, um, sort of fades to the background for me when I'm able to interact with it in this kind of a a really nice fluid way. So customized, similar to case on it, solves the complexity problem, um, but it does so while well keeping things declarative, and it, it is also oriented towards keeping your code very dry um, for generating these config files. So uh, that is our preview of uh, you know, some of the developer-oriented tools. I'm, I'm sure invariably there are a lot of other tools. Uh, Tilt is in company with Scaffold and uh, other projects. Brigade has competitors in the form of Argo Project. Um, this is sort of just a tasting plate for you uh, of some of the different types of solutions that are out there uh, because it would be impossible to dive into all of them, but uh, there are a lot of great uh, other tools that you know we haven't covered here today. Um, one thing I'll note uh, before we get to the wrap up and summary here is just that uh, the experience that you want to push for for your developers kind of depends on your context. Uh, the The context that I work in, um, we're trying to uh, really simplify things for companies that are uh, just onboarding to uh, Kubernetes to begin with, which means we want as minimal uh, burden on them as possible to port their apps over. So um, we've invested with build packs and some of these other technologies to give you sort of this git push workflow. Uh, and the, the system uh, is its NetApp Kubernetes service, but if you're interested in that, you can check it out. But uh, I, I think what everyone is aiming for at the end of the day is something similar. It's taking a and gluing them together, integrating them. I don't think any one tool is going to do that. So that's that's point six on our summary here. But uh, the other uh, just things to note are Kubernetes is, is inherently complex. It's our space shuttle protecting us from the, the ravages of distributed system space outside. Um, that's okay, uh, but people still need to know how to use it. They, they, not everyone needs to be an astronaut. 
uh, trained for years to go up in the space shuttle. Um, so we need to look into solutions that can make that a lot more approachable. There are a lot of solutions out there, um, probably too many to go th for any one person, myself included, to go through fully. Um, and it's worth noting that no one tool solves all of these concerns currently. I think in the future, we may see uh, frameworks emerge that um, you know bundle some of these tools together and um, provide a neat workflow in that way. But uh, we're early enough in the process that everything is still sort of uh, mostly modularized to a particular domain. Um, some tools work by reducing the amount of YAML we have to work with. We saw that with admission controllers. We saw that with build packs. Um, and others uh, try and take you away from YAML altogether. They provide you with a DSL like JavaScript or something like Python, um, hopefully a language that you already know, um, and allow you to simplify by reducing the burden of you having to learn yet another system or yet another tool. And yeah, that is the presentation for today's webinar. So uh, thank you for attending. Uh, if there are any questions, I think uh, Karen is gonna help uh, tee those up for me now. Awesome, thanks Paul for a great presentation. Um, we have time for questions. If you have questions, as a reminder, please drop them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as we have time for. There currently aren't any, so. <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> I will I will send you one as soon as we get one. Well, I have a question for you, Karen. Um, how, how did I do on Helm and the other projects there that, that we covered? Are, are there any uh, additional details that, that you would add, uh, considering uh, you work pretty closely with those folks? No, I think you're pretty up to date with most of it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, Uh, someone asked if we can share the recorded webinar. I believe this will be on the CNCF website after, um, including the slides. Yes, there's also a CNCF YouTube channel uh, that I subscribe to and they are lightning quick. They usually get that stuff up in like a couple hours. Uh, I'm sure it being conference season, don't hold them to that uh, standard, but uh, I've been impressed by how fast they've been in the past. Let's maybe give it another minute for questions and see if anyone drops any in. Uh, there's a question. I missed the first few minutes. Do you have details on what the hyperscalers are doing in this space? Uh, Yes, to some degree. It seems like most of, I, I assume by hyperscalers, you mean uh, the, the first party cloud options. Um, it seems like a lot of them are offering uh, their own marketplace of solutions. So they're kind of curating uh, good Helm charts, good operators, um, good, good charts to start out with as a basis for your Kubernetes cluster. Um, a lot of them are integrating uh, monitoring and a lot of other details uh, deeply into their stacks. So they're not, uh, they're sort of taken care of for you. Um, some of the security and uh, auth authentication authorization uh, is, is out of um, your purview. So it's one less thing you have to worry about when you're deploying your app to Kubernetes. Um, and then otherwise, I think a lot of the work that's happening on serverless is actually developer oriented or yeah, developer oriented. Uh, Serverless is a very bad name for a very cool idea, uh, I like to think. So uh, stuff like Knative, or uh, I think the Microsoft project is Kata. Um, there may be other serverless projects like OpenFAS um, that in get integrated in the future. Uh, but uh, you know, all, each cloud seems to be investing in, in a space that uh, simplifies things. I, I think AWS, their play is with Fargate. Um, where the, the basic unit that you think of is the container, not the server. Um, we'll see where they take that. I think they're still a little bit uh, a little bit in development compared to Microsoft and Google. Uh, but 
Uh, yeah, I, I think the what they end up layering on top of those serverless options is going to be a big part of uh, how they address developer productivity. Um, I should say that uh, for the hot reload uh, type tools, um, you know, we talked about Tilt as one option. Google has released Scaffold, um, which does some similar things to Tilt uh, as sort of an open source project that you can use to um, really quickly iterate on uh, containers that you're, you're working with. Um, I would argue that MetaParticle uh, as a side effect achieves some of that same uh, uh, process of providing you a faster feedback loop. Um, but yeah, there's, I, I would say a lot of that is scattered or optional or, you know, in the case of scaffold, it works with, with any cloud. It's not just Google cloud. So, um, it's, it's still being figured out. Great. Um, next question. Is there any Pythonic way to solve YAML problems? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, so I, I think there's two questions here. One is, uh, can you make it easier to read and uh, more terse? And um, I, I think another Pythonic attribute is there's really one sort of blessed way to approach a problem. Um, and it's usually like a best practice or the standard way. Um, I think that standard way of addressing things is still getting figured out. Um, tools that are relying on Starlark uh, like Isopod are a great start to that. Um, rather than using YAML, they, they output to protobuf, I believe. Um, so uh, you really are working directly in Python and uh, solving a lot of these issues. Um, that said, uh, you know, the, a lot of the fields that get filled in, like the port number for your app or the container image uh, that you're basing your, your work on or um, any of those other details, uh, a lot of that uh, it, you're either losing in a lossy abstraction because you're setting a default value um, or you're just reorganizing how you're filling in those values. So um, you're, you're going to make a trade off at the end of the day of either uh, reorganizing things in a more Pythonic way, but there's still being a whole boatload of values you have to fill in um, or uh, choosing to uh, pick intelligent defaults that you can override um, and having things work that way. That can be a little more magical. Um, I don't think the community has quite uh, solidified around uh, uh, what what is best to have an intelligent default for versus what is best to, uh, you know, just reorganize in a, in a better way. Um, that's, that's something that we're exploring. So uh, explore with us. Cool. Um, next question. If you were just starting with Kubernetes, what would you use? What would I use? I, I think uh, Helm is a great starting place. Um, if you're just getting started with Kubernetes and you don't want uh, too much of this uh, stuff to get messy, you can start with Helm. Um, Helm includes templates, which is sort of uh, the, the bare minimum you want to have in order to create uh, flexible and uh, easy deployments. Um, Helm also helps organize things uh, in a way that like your logical application is kind of bundled together um, in, in a set of files. Uh, so, you know, with Helm, you don't really have to worry about CNAB or OAM or Rudder or um, any of the other solutions like Ksonnet or Customize. Like Helm does a lot out of the box. Um, but it, it doesn't do any everything. Um, it, it can benefit from being combined with uh, uh, tools that reduce the hot, the hot reload loop, give you more feedback uh, faster as a developer. So uh, start with Helm and then uh, it's a branch out from there after you, you get some comfort. Awesome. Okay, next question. One of the challenges is this Right. One of the challenges is the secret and configuration management on YAML that contains sensitive information. Is there any project on Kubernetes to handle this? Yeah, actually. So uh, I think if you look in the Isopod case on it or uh, uh, gosh, customize, um, all of them actually have specific sections that call out, uh, you know, bundling and secrets. Um, I'm sure some of the other tools that I covered today have have some information on that, but they, they all have their own unique approach to um, how to uh, safely um, pull in secrets to your, your value, uh, your file of uh, that contains values. Um, 
there's one project, I believe, by Bitnami. Um, it escapes me. It's maybe Bitnami or GoDaddy. I can't remember which, but it it's a way to encode uh, a secret in, in, uh, in a hash that is knowable only to your secret store on your Kubernetes cluster. It requires some tooling to be there as well. Um, but you can safely commit it to your Git repo um, and uh, not worry about someone just deploying that to your cluster and uh, having it work as well. It's, it's, it relies on some other um, secret information that's stored on the Kubernetes cluster itself. Uh, so I, I would look in the projects by GoDaddy or Bitnami um, for something a little more advanced in, in that area. Okay, I think this will be our last question. What about tools like Rancher, which give it um, GUI and possibility to modify the gov or sorry, to modify the Kubernetes environment? Uh, yeah, I think tools like that are great. Um, they're really useful for debugging um, when you're live debugging, but uh, I would say they are uh, antithetical or counter to uh, some of the goals of Kubernetes. Uh, part of what Kubernetes and containers are about is immutable infrastructure. Um, and, you know, part of, uh, in parts of this presentation, we talked about Git being your source of truth. Um, when you're applying a patch using kubectl or you're, uh, you're modifying things live uh, that are in production um, and deploying that way, uh, you lose that, that Git as a source of truth. You lose that, um, that insight into everything that's going on the cluster, knowing that it's been fully tested by CI and all that. Um, so I, I think that approach is, again, useful uh, tool to have in your belt, but it would not be the way that I'd want to deploy everything to production um, for my clusters. Okay, last question. I'm going to do this quickly. What is your opinion about TOML, T-O-M-L? <laughs> yeah, TOML is uh, an alternative to YAML. Um, I mean, I like TOML. Uh, it reads a little more cleanly to me, and I don't have to deal with a lot of the spacing ugliness, but um, I think it... it fumbles in a lot of the same areas uh, as YAML at the end of the day. When you get a lot of data in TOML, um, it can be as uh, burdensome in some areas as YAML. Um, it's great if you can make TOML your, uh, your markup language of choice. Um, I think there's some Go tools by, uh, gosh, I forget his name. I remember his, his GitHub username, SPF13. Um, uh, there's some tools from him, I think, called Viper uh, that is used in Hugo for, you can use any configuration language you want and Viper will translate it. Um, that, that stuff, uh, I think, is really neat, but at the end of the day, it's still a markup language and it's still uh, an awkward fit and uh, there's, you, you're still mapping to Kubernetes resources and Docker files. Uh, so uh, it's an improvement but it's, it's one minor improvement uh, on the road to the ultimate goal of uh, reducing complexity for developers. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna have to end things now. Um, great, thanks Paul for a great presentation. That's all the time we have for questions. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And the webinar recordings and slides will be online later today. We're looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day, thanks.